you're not going to run that much. Uh, for some reason, the link Robert gave me doesn't seem to be. There we go. OK. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Culture Speaker Series. Today, we have George Wade with us. Uh, before we begin, we're going to go ahead and um, do a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the land that ASU's campuses are built on. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick, and then we'll get started. Arizona is home to 22 indigenous tribes. Arizona State University's campuses are situated on the homelands of many tribal nations. In particular, the Autumn And Pipash, and acknowledge the many indigenous communities who reside in this territory. Skigik is the Autumn word that is now known as Phoenix, which was settled in 1881 by occupiers. The ancestors of the Aatham, the Huhugam, created canals and utilized surrounding rivers that are the basis of the current irrigation system that feeds Skihigik today. These waterways have always been the foundation and livelihood of the residents within the valley. Throughout the past 500 years, the impact of colonialism have been detrimental to indigenous lands and languages, affecting their livelihood. Many people who live in the Southwest are unaware of this history. Furthermore, ASU's indigenous student community consists of over 3,000 strong, not including faculty, staff, and alumni, who continue to thrive, educate, and advocate for the strengthening of indigenous ways of life. As the Autumn call it, Himdak, the way of life for the Autumn, encompassing their culture, traditions, identity, and being. As Autumn and indigenous peoples, our identity is tied to the land. Like our own bodies, we must respect and care for it, and we urge everyone to do the same. We challenge you to educate yourself about the history and the communities who continue to thrive today. Moving forward, it is vital to honor and respect that you are always on Indigenous land. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to our host, Don Marinelli. Good afternoon, AME. Don Marinelli here, and I'm uh, coming to you from Orlando, Florida, which is rather uh, significant and poignant considering our guest today. Uh, George Wade is a legend in when it comes to location-based and themed entertainment. And I was thinking of George very much just a couple of days ago when I went to Disney Springs, uh, which is the latest incarnation of downtown Disney, and it was, everything was themed. I mean, everything was absolutely themed. And yet as George and I were discussing, what, what I felt was missing was the immersive quality that we aspire to with themed entertainment. And, and so having George uh, present to us today is significant for uh, a number of reasons. If you were to take location in themed entertainment and deconstruct it, uh, guess what? You're gonna end up with arts, media, and engineering. It's gonna end up with what we're focused on. And when you think about digital culture, uh, well, very much that is what's keeping the arts, media and engineering alive and e ever more poignant. And so having George as our guest is uh, a special treat for me and it's going to be a very special treat for all of you. I mean, because basically you're gonna be listening to the Yoda of location-based and themed entertainment. So George, welcome to Arizona State University. Arts, Media, and Engineering Online. Take it away. Well, Don, thank you very much for that uh, more than gracious uh, introduction. I'm not sure that I'm completely worthy of all of those uh, wonderful statements, but uh, again, thank you very much. And thank you all for this opportunity to present to you. Uh, I've had a wonderful career, 40-year career. Last month was my 40th anniversary of having started in location-based entertainment. So if you'll bear with me for one second, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and we'll get this uh, uh, show on the road here. So Don, if you'll do me a favor, you can see my screen, my friend. Excellent. So uh, location-based entertainment, it is, 
uh, a wonderful form of entertainment that uh, 40 years ago was basically amusement parks and today encompasses so many different facets of the entertainment world. And today we're gonna take a, a few moments to be able to talk about uh, what is location-based entertainment. I'm gonna provide you some examples, but most importantly, I'm also gonna talk about different ways that you can go ahead and to get into this industry. Now, if you hold off for one second, I need to step out of this to make one small change on my screen here, and now we'll go back to it. Um, First of all, you might be wondering, so who the heck is it that is talking to you today? And just some very quick background. I, uh, I'm a graduate of UCLA's uh, School of Theater, Film and Television with a degree in uh, uh, set light and lighting design. But during my time at UCLA, I discovered I was a relatively mediocre set and lighting designer, but I was actually very good at stage management and technical direction. And that provided a wonderful foundation for what has become this career. Uh, coming out of college, I had an opportunity to go to work for Walt Disney Imagineering uh, on the development of Epcot Center in Tokyo Disneyland. And over the next decade, I worked on a number of Disney projects and then went back to live theater for a few years in New York before returning to LBE. I've worked on projects in 15 different countries around the world. Uh, that include casinos, shopping destinations, theme parks, and other forms of LBE. And I was vice president of location-based entertainment at MGM Studios for a five-year period, which really allowed me to gain an understanding for how do major entertainment brands interface with location-based entertainment. Back in 2009, I formed my business here, uh, Bay Laurel Advisors, uh, and my company now works with a wide range of different entertainment clients. We serve as project managers for developing LBE projects, as well as advising major entertainment brands uh, on how to work within LBE, including Crayola, uh, Peanuts Worldwide, Xbox and their Halo brand, Angry Birds, and Hasbro Toys. So location-based entertainment, it begins with creativity. Uh, and there are many different facets to it. And I'm gonna start off by saying that location-based entertainment is just another form of theater. It's a more permanent form of theater. And frankly, in many respects, it's a more uh, flexible form of theater. And many of the disciplines that we find in theater today, we also find in location-based entertainment. Uh, from the design standpoint, you know, we have our conceptual designers, our master planners, architects, landscape architects, uh, and they look at the overall layouts and the theming. We have the show designers who uh, come up with the creativity of what are the actual guest experiences? What are the scripts and the stories and the character development? And then finally, there are the designers who work on the execution of sets, lighting, audio, and show systems. So it, uh, the old phrase, it takes a village, from a creative standpoint, it does take a team of people who bring their respective creative skills to the table to bring these projects to life. However, in this day and age, technology is absolutely critical. And this is really where the engineering side comes into play. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with a wide range of different engineers going all the way back to my days on Epcot Center with the ride systems engineers, uh, the electromechanical engineers, uh, the water engineers, all working on different aspects of the project. Uh, from the mechanical side with ride technologies, fountains and water effects and simulation technology, special effects with holograms, lighting effects, and fiber optics uh, technology. The digital technology has really become a huge part of location-based entertainment. Japan. And then finally, the control side with ride control systems, uh, master uh, uh, lighting control systems, and show control systems. So it all started with amusement parks. And the first amusement parks occurred in the 1920s as seaside piers in New Jersey, uh, where people would go to the seashore 
And entrepreneurs realized that these people who were coming to the beach were also open to different forms of entertainment. And that was where we would see, you know, in essence, uh, circus acts were being done on these piers uh, in uh, New Jersey. Uh, the development of the roller coaster then helped to uh, expand on what amusement parks uh, had become. And they were really the stable of location-based entertainment until the mid-1950s when the genius of Walt Disney invented Disneyland. Now, I could spend hours on end talking about what motivated Walt Disney to create Disneyland uh, and then the process that he went through to develop this park. What were some of the founding principles of what he was attempting to create? And then the study of how did Disneyland evolve over the next decade of Walt's life? Uh, because it really did serve as the foundation for everything that is in location-based entertainment today. Uh, I highly encourage all of you to do a little bit of reading about this. There are a number of books and articles about the founding of uh, Disneyland that then eventually led to Walt Disney World in Orlando. It's absolutely fascinating. For the rest of the, the 1970s and 1980s, really the LBE industry was the traditional amusement parks like the Six Flags parks, as well as uh, Disneyland, Disney World, Universal Studios, and the SeaWorld theme parks. The industry didn't go th uh, through too much evolution until the late 1980s, when Las Vegas saw a major boost in experiential design. Steve Wynn, who developed the Mirage Hotel, uh, Bellagio, Treasure Island, and the Wynn Resort, really was at the forefront of this uh, genesis. The first project, as you'll see in the middle of my screen here, is the volcano at the Mirage Hotel. I had the pleasure of working on that project and sitting in the background of some of the initial meetings. And Mr. Wynn said, we have to have a must-see attraction something that everybody talks about and they go home and they tell their friends, oh my God, you must go see this. And the volcano at uh, the Mirage, it, it hit on all of those uh, uh, points. Um, when the project opened, it's right on the Las Vegas Strip. And it was one of those things where people would congregate by the thousands to watch this volcano erupt because no one had ever done this before. It forced Las Vegas to really up its game from being a gaming center with mediocre restaurants and mediocre hotel rooms into a true entertainment destination. Uh, his second project was the Bellagio uh, with the wonderful fountain show that is famous to this day. And then he finally followed up with Treasure Island and the pirate show at Treasure Island, uh, where he brought live actors into the mix creating this show that again, thousands of people would watch every night. The advances that we saw in Las Vegas were carried on into other forms of location-based entertainment and really helped to spur a lot of additional development in this industry. So from here, I'm now going to touch upon a number of different segments of LBE from a very top level standpoint because uh, we only have an hour with each other today. Uh, but I hope that as we look at some of these additional projects, it'll spur your interest to go study them with a little bit more, more fervor. Family Entertainment Centers is a fast growing segment of location-based entertainment. Uh, shopping centers especially have discovered that they are not just a place where consumers go to purchase goods. They are a place where consumers are looking for experiences. Uh, people want to get out of the house and they want to enjoy themselves. And so the shopping centers are as much about offering those experiences, which include going to the movies, restaurant and dining, uh, health clubs, uh, wellness, and also location-based entertainment. Uh, and here are just a few examples of projects that fall into that mix. Uh, Lego Discovery Center, which is in the middle of the screen, is a 30,000 square foot family entertainment center. They've opened 15 locations across the United States, almost all of them in shopping malls. Uh, on the far left is Wonderworks, which is more geared toward tourism markets. Places like Orlando, Florida, uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
And then on the far right is the Crayola experience. And I'll talk about this one a little bit later in the presentation, but there are five Crayola experience locations that have opened in the United States. Each one serves a different type of demographic. Each one offers a little bit of a different creative experience for the guest, but family entertainment centers are a growing area of the industry. Another fast emerging segment is pop-up entertainment experiences. The Museum of Ice Cream, which is on the far left, really was the first of the so-called pop-up experiences. These were geared more toward a millennial market uh, and really focused uh, partially on what they call Instagrammable moments, uh, where I'm able to take my experiences, take pictures and share them with my friends on social media. Uh, the Museum of Ice Cream was famous for their uh, swimming pool of sprinkles uh, and was a huge photographic moment uh, in the industry. Uh, at first, most of the pop-up experiences were of a um, uh, uh, more generic nature, but eventually developers began to utilize major entertainment brands as the vehicles for these pop-up experiences because you know they, the great brand value helped in the marketing of these programs. So on the far left is the Dr. Seuss experience, which opened in October of 2019 in Toronto, Canada, was originally set to run for eight weeks. Because of sellout attendance, they extended the run for another two months before COVID uh, came on. And uh, then, of course, we all went into you know, the shutdown. And in the middle is a project that I worked on in summer of 2019, the Friends Experience which was meant to be a 30-day pop-up in New York. And it was so overwhelmingly successful. They extended the run for another month in New York. They moved to Boston. And then they uh, uh, have now reopened this past Wednesday in New York City for an extended run in New York City. And basically, it takes you behind the scenes of Friends. Uh, and in the one picture here, you're able to have your picture taken with your friends sitting on the sofa that was made famous in the television show. Museums is a place that many people don't expect to see entertainment, but the more intelligent museums have identified, they're really in the entertainment business. And so, um, but they also have an education mission that they need to fulfill. So the way that they have worked around that is to bring Turing exhibitions in, which will bring a level of entertainment into the museum but will also allow them to then take guests who come to see the Turing exhibition and uh, encourage them to explore the educational side of the museum. Two of the more popular uh, museum Turing exhibitions uh, that have launched, Titanic has been running for over 20 years. At one point they had five different tours that were touring around the world. Um, it was based on artifacts that were taken from the expeditions to the Titanic. Uh, including uh, massive pieces of the hull uh, and elements of that nature. Uh, it encourages people to come and visit with us where we can then share the rest of our educational mission. Now, uh, this past month, I actually helped to open a Turing exhibition at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, called Crayola Idea Works, which is a blend of uh, idea. IDEA is a design thinking standard utilized in product development. And we uh, were able to take IDEA and create a full exhibition around that. And what I'd love to do right now is to play you a short video uh, to introduce you to Crayola IdeaWorks.
project has uh, received a warm reception. And as you can see from uh, different elements of the video, uh, we have a wide range of different interactive technology. Uh, the teams that put that together brought together creative artists, uh, as well as the technology, uh, technology experts in helping to be able to create these wonderful guest experiences. Uh, the visitation is about a 60 minute length of stay by the guest. And so far the public reaction has been absolutely wonderful. Theme dining is another area that again is growing at rapid rate. 20 years ago, uh, over 20 years ago now, 30 years ago, uh, Hard Rock Cafe was really the first in this segment. Um, and as we have seen, so many different comes to market. Now, one of the core aspects of this is that it's really critical that you have good food if you're going to have a dining establishment. Two of the more successful themed dining operations are here. Margaritaville all uh, started because of a Jimmy Buffett song. And it has become as much a lifestyle venue as it is something based on Jimmy Buffett's work. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of people that don't even know the Jimmy Buffett song anymore, but they know that they love Margaritaville. They have opened 40 locations in North America. There are now 15 Margaritaville uh, resorts and hotels. Uh, there is senior living uh, communities in Florida and South Carolina themed off of this. Uh, it's really truly an entertainment phenomenon. And then Bubba Gump Shrimp Factory uh, is, a ba is based off of the Forrest Gump movie of the same uh, name of for uh, with Bubba Gump. And they have opened 29 locations on a worldwide basis. This brings theming, but it also ties in the spirit from each of Margaritaville and the Forrest Gump movie into each of these two concepts. Themed hotels is a rapidly, rapidly growing area of location-based entertainment. Hospitality, of course, took a big hit during the pandemic, but it is really coming back strong at the moment. Uh, I talk with many of the developers in this segment and they're beginning to see demand pick up and they're beginning to get projects back into development. Uh, for example, uh, Nickelodeon has one resort that is open in the Dominican Republic and a second resort that will be opening in Mexico this summer. MTV is in development on a uh, hotel in New York City. Uh, Atari Games has announced a project uh, for, I believe in Phoenix, if I remember right. And in front of you now is the Cartoon Network Hotel, a project that I worked on for three years. And what made this a fun project was, the mission here was to take a three-star motel and convert it into the home of the Cartoon Network characters. Uh, we, it required some, a very deft touch of really trying to identify what does a hotel guest want in a themed environment? You don't want it to be too cartoony, but you do want it to meet the promise. And then there were, uh, we had to overlay technology into different areas. On the picture on the left, for instance, is the elevator bank of the hotel. And we didn't want to just have this elevator bank standing there in the middle of the hotel. We wanted to do something that would give it a purpose for being there. So the designers came up with this idea to let's use uh, video monitors going up the outside of the hotel. And then our animators created 10 different animated segments with our cartoon characters to show them going up and down the elevators. Post opening, we would have kids who would want to sit in the lobby for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, just watching the characters going up and down the elevator. It was a, it was a fun experience to watch. Uh, I have another short video on this project that I'll share with you right now.
The project opened in uh, January of 2020. Uh, at the initial press events, the reporter from the York Tribune brought her 10 year old son and encouraged him to write the review for her. And as a part of that review, he finished off by saying, this is where the characters from Cartoon Network should live. And we were all very proud to uh, get his complete endorsement on that. Another hotel project I worked on is the Peanuts Hotel in Kobe, Japan. Now here in the United States, Peanuts is seen much more as a family brand appealing to younger children. But in Asia, we, uh, the brand also has a very strong following with millennials. And a hotel developer in Japan wanted to create something that would appeal to that demographic. And the Peanuts Hotel is a boutique hotel uh, with some very nice high price points that appeal to that consumer and was designed to bring the Peanuts design with a sense of sophistication and with a flair, uh, a very fun project that we all enjoyed working. Video games are huge, as all of you know. It's a fantastic part of the entertainment uh, landscape as a whole. Xbox and Halo have been a client of mine now for five years, and we were talking about the fact that uh, Xbox and Halo both have a very strong presence at E3 and at Comic-Con every year, yet so few of their fans are able to experience both E3 and Comic-Con. And that led to a discussion, what happens if we could take Comic-Con on the road and take the Halo experience out to their fans in different cities? That led to Halo Outpost Discovery, which we ran to five cities over five different weekends in 2019. And the whole idea was to allow the Halo fan and the non-Halo fan alike to be able to experience Halo. Uh, 120,000 square feet of activities, including the history of Halo, the ring experience, uh, virtual reality game uh, that was specifically designed around Halo, uh, as well as seminars that were conducted by uh, the game developers, by Frank O'Connor and Kiki Wolfkill, two of the leads in the development of Halo from the very beginning, uh, as well as voice talent from the shows. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was an experience that was immersive in many respects for our fans and was extremely well received. Uh, toward the end of the run, we produced this very short video, uh, really as a thank you to our fans. One of the things that we found very interesting was that fans who attended the, uh, the first show in Orlando, Florida, we would end up seeing them in Philadelphia, and then we would see them in Chicago at the next stop. Uh, it became something that they wanted to continue to experience over and over. Uh, and all the folks at Halo really truly agreed. It brought Halo to life in a way that had not never been done before. Uh, and the, again, the fan reaction was absolutely terrific. Uh, so those are just some sectors of location-based entertainment. There are many others, but that is uh, just a, a sample, shall we say, of different sectors that are very active uh, at the moment. But then we have to ask ourselves the question, what does the consumer desire? If we're going to try to meet their desires, we need to understand them. First and foremost, they want us to touch their emotions. They want to feel. They either want to have us touch their heart uh, through our storytelling, or they want us to you know, uh, scare them with fear. Uh, they want to feel. Secondly, immersive engagement is so ultimately important. Let me participate is something that we always hear. Uh, 30 years ago, location-based entertainment was a passive experience. Today, it is all about immersiveness and how does the guest participate? How do they create their own experience within the guardrails that we create for them? Repeatable interactions are extremely important. Uh, each visit needs to be unique unto itself. Uh, 
And that is partially because so many of these go into markets where we want to encourage guests to come back again and again. Uh, that's what creates the business case for the project. And that also leads to what is the strong value to cost proposition? If we're gonna charge a guest $20 for an experience, it's imperative that we deliver $20 worth of entertainment value to them. So one of the things that we are always doing when we're in the creative development of a project is benchmarking ourselves. And we are doing focused market research testing to bring in people so that we can assure ourselves that the project is not only meeting creative goals, but it is also meeting the, what we believe the consumer expectation will be so that we can get return on investment. Finally, something that is very important today is that experiences that can be shared with family and friends via social media. Uh, guests. Immediately, if they like something or more importantly, if they don't like something. So it is important for us that we are meeting you know, that expectation of what they're capable of doing via social media. And we create opportunities for them that are social media friendly. So a number of people ask me, what are my favorite projects? And in some cases I, I respond, well, whoever wants to say who's their favorite child. But uh, that being the case, there are some projects that I take great pride uh, at the very bottom is the forum shops. Uh, originally, the developers of the forum, what became the forum shops, were looking at doing a shopping mall adjacent to Caesar's Palace, but there was no real design to it. And the uh, president of Caesar's uh, contacted our company and said, look, we need your help at trying to figure out how to create something that is worthy of being attached to Caesar's Palace. And so our digital design team created a project that really met those goals uh, and it involved so much technology development because of some of the challenges that we faced. For instance, uh, the Farm Shops was the first place to use cove ceilings with lighting effects to create the daytime and nighttime effects. That was all uh, because of us trying to come up with a solution that we could not have skylights that would allow daylight and nighttime through the skylights because of air conditioning challenges. Um, and so our lighting team came up with a way of using existing lighting control systems to be able to create those lighting effects. A second project went on a much, much smaller scale is the Enchanted Laboratory, which was a show for Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia. It was a one actor, three animated character show that also incorporated a numerous amount of special effects produced in 1986, many of the special effects were very unique. And we turned to magician techniques to be able to create many of these effects. Uh, the show was so popular that while it was intended to have a three year run at Bush Gardens, it ended up running for a 10 year period. Of course, I talked about the Cartoon Network Hotel a few minutes ago, but another project that we just opened this past October is Top Golf Angry Birds. Uh, imagine being able to play Angry Birds, but instead of doing it on your mobile device, you are doing it with a golf ball and a golf club. Uh, and let me show you a little bit about that.
This project required the game developers from Rovio working in concert with the game developers at Top Golf Studios uh, to figure out a way to create a game that would replicate the mobile game in a fashion that guests would truly relate to it. Uh, we developed it during the pandemic all by remote and were able to launch this in uh, October of this past year at a number of the different Top Golf locations. And in fact, for those of you who are in the Phoenix area, you're able to go and play Angry Birds at the Top Golf in Scottsdale, Arizona, as well as down in Gilbert, Arizona. I encourage you to do so. It is a lot of fun. We're now working on the second set of games, which they hope to be able to launch later this year, where we'll in introduce more of the uh, Angry Birds characters as part of the gameplay. Finally, you know, some people say, well, what's available in the Valley for people to be able to go see? One of the, my latest projects was the Crayola Experience at Chandler Fashion Center. I was actually living in Chandler for two months to do the installation on this project. As I might have mentioned before, our company has served as the project director for Crayola on all five of their Crayola experiences. And the latest one we opened in Chandler at the Fashion Center. It is 22,000 square feet, 20 different hands-on uh, guest attractions. The core demographic for this is children's ages five through nine. But part of our mission was to create something that didn't only appeal to children, but it was something that the families could share together and that their parents would enjoy as much as uh, the, their children. Uh, as I said, this is our fifth uh, attraction that had opened. Uh, well, we had uh, excellent attendance up until the moment that the pandemic hit. We have just reopened uh, at the beginning of March, and I encourage any of you who are in Chandler, let me know, and I'd love to be able to set you up with a couple of ticks to be able to go see it. It's a really good attraction. So let's get to the, the stuff about how this really applies to all of you. Do you belong in location-based entertainment? And my simple answer to you is, if you are creative, either from a design standpoint or from an engineering standpoint, heck yes, you really do belong in that location-based entertainment. It's a, it's a wonderful entertainment platform with a lot of different variety to it. So it, it gives a lot of opportunities for different experiences. Uh, things never get stale for me because I'm always able to work on something that is new and different. Industry growth patterns are continuing to accelerate. Uh, a wide range of different skills are, are necessary for these projects to um, uh, come to life. And it is growing into new areas. Immersive theater is a rapidly expanding category. Uh, Immersive Everywhere in London uh, did a show called The Great Gatsby uh, that was doing excellent business prior to the pandemic. Uh, as soon as Great Britain reopens, they will be launching their next immersive theater experience, uh, Doctor Who. Um, I've seen the initial designs on that project, and it looks like it's going to be very engaging, where you are a part of the theatrical experience. Game rooms are also uh, you know, growing uh, in great number. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, pop-up experiences. I'm working on two additional pop-up experiences now one involving Crayola and one involving uh, Peanuts that will launch in 2022. Finally, and in some ways, just as importantly as everything else, it is a fun way to make a living. Uh, I've been doing this for 40 years and I have no uh, desire to slow down whatsoever. This is just, this is great. I'm having such a great time with the different projects I'm working on, but also with the people I get to collaborate with. It's an industry with a lot of wonderful people. So how do you get into this uh, crazy business? So I'm going to I'm going to uh, touch on some things that for many of you you'll say, oh, I already know that, so bear with me here. But the first question I get asked is, well, is the industry going to come back uh, from COVID? The an simple answer is, all trend lines right now are indicating yes, we are going to see growth in the industry. Um, a number of tours are already beginning to pick up. Friends reopened in New York yesterday. Uh, Nerf Live is due to open at the end of May in Dallas. 
of course, we're all having to look at what are the COVID protocols that we have to put in place uh, you know, for these projects to be safe for our guests and safety is a paramount concern, but the industry will grow, I promise you that. The next step that I usually advise to people, and I do um, uh, work with a number of students at UCLA, by the way, and the first thing I tell them, set up a LinkedIn profile, seek out potential connections in the industry that you're uh, uh, interested in. If you're a designer, look at the people who are doing design in this industry, reach out and connect with them. Identify ASU graduates who are in the business. Uh, I know that many people are very willing to work with alums from their university, uh, you know, to mentor them and to help them get into the industry. I know I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a UCLA Bruin who uh, wanted to pay it forward as well and uh, took the meeting with me and helped me get the interviews at Disney that led to this wonderful career. Finally, on LinkedIn, that many of the people that you might follow will um, have wonderful insights from the posts that they put on LinkedIn. Read, research, learn. There are trade organizations that have young professional outlets. IAPA is the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. They uh, have a young professionals uh, group. Uh, uh, on the next page, I have links for you for uh, to IAPA's Young Professionals Group. The Themed Entertainment Association is a trade group uh, of the designers and the manufacturers of the LBE industry. Founded in 1991, it was geared to really help these organizations build a stronger industry. And they have their next gen uh, program, again, for uh, young professionals and college grads interested in getting into the themed entertainment. And then Licensing Global uh, also has their young professionals uh, network as well. Identify your interests, research companies that provide the services that meet your interests. If you're into design, look at the design firms. Reach out to these companies and try to sink in, seek internships with them. Uh, I have seen many a case where a person has interned with a company and that has been uh, led to full-time employment because the company was so impressed with their talents. And again, once again, seek information and network, network, network. There's a number of companies that are in the business. Uh, I've listed out some of them in the different categories here. Now, everyone wants to work for Disney and students at UCLA will always say to me, well, how can I get into Disney? First of all, pre-pandemic, it was hard to get into Disney. Post-pandemic, Disney right now is just not hiring. But many of the companies that you see here uh, on this page are companies that are seeing their business uh, grow uh, rapidly uh, as companies are coming out of the pandemic. JRA is a design firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was on the phone with them yesterday and we were talking specifically about the fact that they've had a number of new projects get started over the past 30 days. So you will see the industry begin to grow. And many of these companies that are listed here in these different categories are companies well worth researching and, and having outreach to. So finally, I'm providing a few links here that are great for research purposes. Uh, IAPA and their Young Professionals Organization, the TEA with their Next Gen Organization, and License Global. Two other resources that are very worthwhile is In Park Magazine. Uh, they are a both a um, uh, hard magazine published uh, on a quarterly basis, as well as their website. They have both breaking news and they also publish articles that are of great interest to their readers on different trends within the industry. Blue Loop is strictly a um, online uh, resource that also publishes articles of trends in the industry, uh, as well as breaking news. Blue Loop is based in Europe. In Park Magazine is based in the United States, but they both cover LBE on a global basis. So thank you very much for your time today. I hope you have found this uh, uh, interesting and, of, uh, and helpful. And uh, I will look forward to any questions that you might have. Well, George, that was terrific. I mean, that was just terrific. 
All right. Um, well, I will field questions from the YouTube if anyone has any. Um, anybody in the <clears throat> anybody in the Zoom call with us is welcome to ask questions at this time. Thanks, George. It was a great presentation. I've I've actually I did some work sort of in related industries uh, between my sort of uh, uh, graduate school days and you know going on to PhD days, and it's really interesting to see how this is continuing to evolve and all the different uh, all the different angles uh, of this, all the different uh, different venues for this work. I'm curious if you see any. Any technology trends? You you mentioned a few things like artificial or, or, or uh, augmented reality and things like that. But are there any like what's the what's there, what are the biggest technology trends that you think are going to shape this uh, this world? Uh, augmented reality right now, I think, is the one that everyone is most focused on. It was virtual reality, but there are major challenges with virtual reality. Part mm -hmm. of it, frankly, is driven by capacity constraints. Uh, at our Halo Outpost Discovery. The virtual reality was one of the most popular attractions and we had a two and a half hour wait in each city because we did not have enough capacity because it's such a singular experience. Whereas augmented reality, if I can put you into the environment, I can also handle larger audiences. Uh, so augmented reality is one of those. Uh, artificial intelligence, we're beginning to see more and more brought into these projects. Um, Turtle Talk at Disney uh, was one of the groundbreaking experiences where I can in real time interact with an animated character, in this case, a talking turtle. It required a live actor though. And so, uh, and emphasis on the word actor uh, because uh, it, you know, for the presentation to work, the character really had to be in character. Um, Imagine being able to do that with AI. And there actually is artificial intelligence work being done with uh, Super Mario that I've recently seen that is really, really wonderful. So those are two areas that I'm seeing a tremendous amount of growth. The third is how do you bring the video game technology into the live theatrical world? Uh, there was an article in the Los Angeles Times uh, about 10 days ago regarding uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream production that is bringing uh, video game technology into it where guests are also able to participate from home. So we're seeing this you know, crashing, not melding, crashing of worlds together that is with, uh, with technology advancing so fast and, and becoming uh, so user-friendly from a cost standpoint as well. We're seeing a lot of capability from that standpoint. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, George. Um, I was watching uh, the second half of your talk. Uh, I was able to, to to watch over YouTube. I had a question about um, some of the the, the location-based entertainment ideas that you have um, with virtual reality. I know you were just talking about augmented reality, but with virtual reality at home becoming more affordable and accessible, um, people are also able to travel a lot more virtually into these sorts of spaces. Um, are there some sort of similar themes and values in, in creating um, location, virtual location-based entertainments as well? Are there ways to teleport users from their home into these architected environments that you're creating as well? Uh, yes, there is. Um, but what I would say to that, Robert, uh, uh, is that um, there are always uh, major corporations that were figuring, we wanna be able to provide everything for the guests to be able to do at home. Uh, Time Warner in the 1990s had a satellite program in Orlando that was completely focused on doing that. We're going to provide you with all of the hardware that allows you to do that. And that program came to a crashing halt because they recognized people want to get out of the home and do things. So really, I think what we really need to be looking forward towards as developers is how do I blend the in-home opportunities with the out-of-home opportunities? That's where you get a, uh, it sounds trite, but a one plus one equals five kind of business scenario, right? So if I can, to your point, create those you know, travel environments via virtual reality at home that encourages you to then make a purchase, 
now I've got a business proposition that is extremely strong. I see, very interesting. I, there are a lot of analogies with that and education actually and online education that we're trying to create as well in terms of getting people to travel and to make the purchase, if you will, but of, of committing themselves to learning and, and, and to, to take them on those trajectories. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting pearls of wisdom. I'm gonna go watch the first half of your talk as well. So Fantastic. thank you very much. Yeah. All, all the good stuff was in the first half, okay. <laughs> George, you mentioned Disney. So I have to bring up that uh, Dis Disney seems to be, uh, I don't wanna say downsizing, but there's been a lot more outsourcing you know, where, whereas Disney Imagineering used to be the be all and end all, it seems to me that there's a lot more going towards third parties. Is, do you see that? Uh, yes, I see them. I, I, I put it this way, Don, what they're, what they're discovering is that it used to be at Disney, the model was not invented here, right? If it didn't happen within the four walls confines of Imagineering, it must not be any good, right? Um, but financial realities over the past decade have forced them uh, you know, to accept the realization there's a lot of wonderful work being done, both creatively and technologically uh, outside of those four walls and that it behooves them to take advantage of it. Uh, Bob Chapek, who's now the, a, the CEO of the Walt, pardon me, the Walt Disney Company, was the head of Imagineering. And, and frankly, he's the one that uh, at times had to use the pointy stick to get everybody you know, to break old habits, shall we say. So I think uh, the pandemic has only accelerated that. Disney can't carry the full-time staff that they used to at Imagineering. And frankly, I think they'll end up being a better company for it. And Don, I'll add one more point to that. Uh, I was at Disney for four years in the early 1980s, and I had plans to make a career out of it. Uh, we opened Epcot, then I went over to Tokyo and opened Tokyo Disneyland. And uh, about nine months after uh, Tokyo Disneyland opened, I got my layoff notice. Uh, it happened to many of us. We went from 2,000 people at Imagineering down to 500 over a two-year period. And like most people who get laid off, you are scared to death. But what I discovered was that it was a wonderful opportunity because I went to work for a small design company and realized that because we're a small company, we have to be much more inventive than you would ever be at Disney. And that's, we didn't have the resources of Disney behind us. Uh, so therefore um, that, that kind of held off some of the innovation that we might want to do but it really forced us to be very clever in how we approach things. But you and I can chat constantly. 100%. Xavier, are there other questions? Um, I have a question and I believe Matt also had a question. Um, but my question was, what in your uh, experience has kind of been uh, the guiding light of recognizing if something is going to be sort of a flash in the pan or if it's going to be a worthwhile thing to pursue because I mean I, I know Don and I have had conversations of how maybe 10 even 20 years ago virtual reality people thought oh that'll never catch on no one will ever want to do that um, and now as you said it's one of the the top if not kind of the top uh, technological endeavors that people are kind of pursuing so is there a way that you figured out um, to delineate between what is going to be kind of a worthwhile thing to, to pursue versus something that? You know, from my standpoint, uh, Xavier, trying to watch guest reactions to me at the end of the day is always the best test. And seeing something that is in the marketplace uh, always gives me a feel for what kind of legs might this have. Uh, so part of what I like about the pop-up experiences and the Turing exhibitions, it's not unlike a, a uh, live theatrical show that I take into tryouts. I see what works during our tryouts. And Don, I see you nodding accordingly from our, our shared history here. Uh, before you take it to Broadway, you wanna try it out. Uh, yeah, you know, some of the great Broadway shows. I remember the show Chorus Line, which I'm sure many of the folks here are too way, way too young to even know what it is. But 
it was a huge, massive hit on Broadway and one of the longest running Broadway shows in the history of Broadway in the 1970s and beyond. Um, before the show got to Broadway, right before it went to Broadway, they introduced four new musical numbers because they had four numbers that weren't working. And it was all from guest reaction. And the four new numbers actually worked, but they had audience feedback. So Xavier, I like to look at, at what uh, guests are telling me by watching them. And then secondly, I look at affordability and is the technology sustainable? 10 years ago, virtual reality was not, I worked on virtual reality projects in the 1990s, but we couldn't figure out how to make a business of it. Uh, how could you tell storytelling with virtual reality? You did not have the technological capability to support the vision of the creative people. Um, so I think that's also, you. there's no magic moment where you say, aha, this is going to work. I think it's a case of being able to study how different uh, entertainment ideas and different technologies slowly merge over time. And then where do I might want to redirect uh, those initiatives to be able to get to you know, what I like to call the promised land of success? All right, thank you. Um, Matt, did you have a question? Um, not really, no. Okay, but I just saw you pop up or that was mostly accidental. Um, nice to earlier, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'm also um, a Bruin, so nice, nice meeting you. Nice to meet you as well. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. Um, all right. Uh, well, unless we have any other questions, uh, Lauren has the last question. Uh, speaking about Super Nintendo World in Japan, uh, what are your impressions and uh, uh, yeah, just what are your impressions and thoughts on the park? Uh, my first impression is I can't wait to have the opportunity to go to Osaka and experience it firsthand. Uh, unfortunately, it won't be anytime soon. Um, secondly, I've talked to many of my cohorts in the industry uh, who have worked on the project. Uh, of course, each was sworn to uh, NDA secrecy with Universo, so there wasn't a lot that they could share with it. Um, but today, literally, I had a text exchange with my former business partner who went back to Universal uh, to be one of the major leads on that project. Um, he's in retirement now, but I texted him today to say it's exciting that uh, Nintendo World opened. And his response to me was very telling. He said, it will be one of the projects of which I take the greatest amount of pride that I've ever had in my career. And this is a gentleman who worked at Disney for 20 years, uh, was with me for five years before he uh, went back to Universal. Uh, and of course, I'd like to s hear him say that the stuff we did together was the stuff he took the greatest amount of pride. But uh, I, the fact that Chaz mentioned that to me today uh, only uh, increases my desire to be able to see that project. And if you'll hang on for one second, I did see an article about it today. Give me one second to call that up and I'll throw this in the, uh, in the chat. And... So the link is there in the chat uh, for people off of Reuters. Uh, you know, the article provided just a little bit of overview. I'm sure that we'll start to see video on this come up over the coming weeks. I will say this about Universal. Their creative game, I think in some ways is equal to or surpassing Disney's creative game. Uh, uh, they were challenged by Steve Burks, who was then the number two person at Comcast uh, Steve Brooks had come from Disney, and when he moved to Universal, uh, the people at Universal didn't believe that they could compete with the mouse. Uh, and uh, Steve Brooks said, why not? Why can't we compete with them? And in fact, we are going to compete with them. The end result of that was Harry Potter uh, and Hogwarts at, um, uh, um, uh, at, in Florida. And lo and behold, it totally upended the industry. And it really forced Disney to up their game with what they did with Avatar uh, at Animal Kingdom uh, and then with Star Wars. I think Mario is going to be on a par with what they've done with Hogwarts. And again, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they've done there. 
All right. Well, thank you for your amazing talk, George. I know I personally thought it was amazing and very insightful uh, as somebody who is looking to go into this business. Um, but with that, I will say thanks everyone for tuning in and we will see you next week. Thank you. Very quickly, Xavier, before everyone signs off, I just want to say if anyone is interested uh, in visiting the Crayola experience, please let you know. And if you could pass that on and I'll do what I can to try to set up a pass for them to go see it. It is a fun project and it would be a good firsthand experience for them to see, you know, something that's in this category. Gotcha. Yeah, we, we will go ahead and set that up. I'm sure Robert will uh, help. All right. Thank you, everyone.